always feel like I'm at Target when I'm at a TED event. <laughs> yes, I would like the milk and those diapers. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, failure. Uh, a lot of tech entrepreneurs don't like to talk about failure, and I write about failure. Um, and so I, I titled this talk, Breaking Up is Hard to Do, How Entrepreneurs Fail. I brought some cards. It's the cardinal sin of TED to have cards, but I have quotes, and I don't, I don't have one of those memories that can do that. Um, there's a famous quote that entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley like to always reference. It's a, it's a quote by Thomas Edison, where he said, I have not failed. I've just found 10,000 ways that don't work which means he failed 10,000 times. Um, but technology people like to pretend they don't fail. They use euphemisms like pivot. I don't know if you've heard of that one. <laughs> they use other ways to say, any way they can say that the word failure, they don't want to do it. And they don't like to talk about it. They, don't, they pretend that they learn from it. They, they say, embrace your failure. And I'm here to tell you, failure is just failure. Um, today, for example, I uh, wrote a story yesterday uh, about Twitter. Everybody knows what's going on with Twitter. It's the, the loudest sale auction ever happening in secret. <laughs> I wrote a story that said that the, the bidders that are supposedly going to bid for Twitter aren't going to bid for Twitter, um, including Google, Disney, Apple. They sent the stock down 20%, which is $3 billion in market value. Suffice it to say, people were angry at me for doing this, uh, including stock entrepreneurs, uh, stock, stock jocks, one of which wrote me, Kara, you ruined the party. The fact that it was a party for a failing company was fascinating to me. And so I wanted to talk about this idea of a failure and how entrepreneurs fail, because they fail in ways the rest of us don't. So here's, I wanted to compare it to um, breaking up. Now, the only thing I have in common with Donald Trump is that I've broken up with a lot of people, too. Um, and I know a lot about breakups. I've been broken up with. I've broken up with people. Um, and these are basically pretty much all the lines that you do, the euphemisms. You deserve better. I deserve better. Uh, my feelings for you are so intense they scare me, which really means my feelings for you are totally non-existent. Um, I need to focus on my career, which really means I'm crushing on a coworker. Um, <laughs> So, you get them all. One of you, you've heard one of these, unless you're one of those people who got married in high school and are still super happy, which... <laughs> the euphemism we use in Silicon Valley is unicorn for that. Um, so, anyway, um, so this is what they do. They, they like take, they, they don't tell the truth and it really means something else, but I kind of like them for it. So, let me go through some of the excuses and how they do it, because in the end, even though Silicon Valley people drive me fucking nuts, um, I do admire how they just suspend disbelief almost continually on their way to their billion dollar homes. <laughs> this is the first one. Let's stay together for the kids. It's a terrible idea. But people in Silicon Valley are always pushing this. They talk about building their culture, building their special team, that this group can't possibly break up. That, they're, that they, are, they have momentum, this is a magical group. They often use the word magical. I don't know if you've heard Apple. Whenever they have an event, everything is magical, even though it's just steel, a little bit of metal, some plastic, and some glass. But it's magical. Um, but they like to talk about their cultures this way. And they have to feel that they can't break up their culture because this family is so important that it can't possibly break up. Well, I'm here to tell you the kids are just fine if people break up. And I'm going to point to a couple of companies um, that you may, may or may not have heard of, the first one being General Magic. Has anyone heard of General Magic here? There's a new documentary. Nobody, exactly. Well, <laughs> General Magic made a device that looks exactly like the iPhone. It worked like the iPhone. It was the iPhone. And in fact, many of the people at the company went on to make the iPhone later, include, including Tony Fidel, Andy Rubin. You might have heard of him. He created Android. Um, Tony Fidel was one of the key people creating the iPod. There were all kinds of people. Another guy, Pierre Omidyar, started eBay. This company was full of children of, this, of General Magic who went on to be better citizens when they went somewhere else. They created this company that I think it was $100 million that they lost, um, creating this device that they sold, I think, 17 of them. Um, 
the fact of the matter is, they were great as a group of people, they were great to come together, but the company itself did not work, even with this incredibly magical group of people. And in breaking up is when the real value of their, of their innovation was created. Another example is Yahoo. Now, as anyone knows me, I spend my life writing about Yahoo and its many failures. This is a company that keeps going. It's like, it's like a Frankenstein of a company. It just never dies. <laughs> Um, and every time you get a new CEO in there, they say, oh, this group of people, it can't, I can fix it. I can make this family work. This family is more dysfunctional than Sarah Palin's. I don't know how else to say it, but it's the case. I'm sorry, you're in San Francisco. You're going to have to take all the liberal shit. So, um, but the fact of the matter is, Yahoo has borne so many amazing entrepreneurs that have gone on to do other things. Jeff Weiner, who just uh, led LinkedIn, Dan Rosenzweig. All kinds of people, I could name dozens and dozens and dozens of people that worked at Yahoo and then went on to greater things. Um, again, it doesn't mean just because a family doesn't work that there can't be greater families created. The last one, of course, is MySpace. Actually, nobody good came out of there. Um, so. No, there were. There were a couple of executives. Anyway, there's a myriad of examples of companies that just didn't work that created better families. The next one, I love, I love cat things, I'm sorry. Um, it's not you, it's the consumer product strategy. P companies never like to blame themselves for their failures. Entrepreneurs especially are particularly pr passionate. They believe themselves to the point of complete delusion. I'm not sure what, what the better word is. But they have to believe in themselves. They have to say everything is right and there's nothing wrong with the product. This is not true. The most basic thing in Silicon Valley, and they always tend to forget it, is the product is the only thing that matters, and the consumer is the only thing that matters, and the technology is the only thing that matters. I'll point to three examples. Google Glass. I'm the only person that still has Google Glass, I think, in the world. It came out, the tech press went crazy, everyone thought it was amazing, and what one, what the thing that people forgot to note was that it, when you put it on, it actually made even supermodels unfuckable. I don't know how else to put it, right? So, and I mean men and women by that. I don't care what your preference is. Again, this is San Francisco. If you put it on a goat, I'm fine with it. And in fact, that was just happening in the Castro this morning when I walked here. So, um, it was, it was a product that just didn't work. I will give you a quick example. I was at one of the launch parties for Google Glass. They, they rented a, one of those New Orleans boats and then they sailed out into the San Francisco Bay. And I was just there and it was like, it was like Boat of Geeks and Kara Swisher. And they were all wearing Google Glass except for me. And one thing good about Google parties is they always have a mountain of shrimp somewhere. And so I was, <laughs> because they can. And so I was sitting by the mountain of shrimp table eating the shrimp and everyone had Google Glass on it. And the problem with Google Glass is you had to say, hello, Glass, or wake it up. Everybody was saying that to each other and turning on everybody else's Google Glass. <laughs> and nobody was interacting with everyone, which is the way Google people like it because they're from another planet and they don't, aren't actually humans. They have a problem doing it on a regular 24 hours a day. That said, it just wasn't a great product, even though it was conceptually a great idea. The idea of visual representation around your face is going to work. Snapchat is about to try it again with their silly looking glasses, and we'll see how it works. Another example is Twitter. Everybody loves Twitter, except they haven't changed their product in forever. They just assumed that everybody loved it and did not keep iterating and creating a product that everyone wants to use. Everyone talks about all the problems of Twitter, all the issues of their executives, all their dysfunction in management, all their mistakes. The very core of the problem with Twitter is the product is not something people want to use enough. That's pretty much it. They could have as many dysfunctional people as they want running the place, and I could think of millions of Silicon Valley companies that are highly dysfunctional and work just fine. Everyone, the problem is the product, and the, the, it, entrepreneurs never try to, try to say that. The third one is Apple Watch. Apple Watch is just not good. It's just not. I know you all, all you Apple fans, it doesn't do anything. It tells the time, but so does my watch, and I have an Apple Watch. So I think one of the things that, it just doesn't, and the new one doesn't either, don't buy it. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Apple, I love Apple, but the Apple Watch sucks. Um, it doesn't work, so I think they always try to blame the consumer for it. The consumer knows. A good example of something that does, does work is the Amazon Echo. If 
you've ever tried it, you should try it. It's a fantastic product. It works. It's satisfying. You talk to it. It gives you information. There's even, there's these things called skills. It even gives you information if you want it, if you ask it, like I do it every morning because I'm an egomaniac. Tell me something good about myself. And they, oh, and it goes, you're really good looking. And I'm like, you're right, I am. <laughs> so I think this is a, a perfect product. Do you remember this? I don't know if, how old you are, but do you remember on Sex and the City when the burger broke up with Carrie on the post-it note? I thought that was funny. I've never been broken up with a post-it note. Um, this is the I just can't thing. I just can't. Actually, the problem with Silicon Valley is they just think they can all the time. And I'll give you a good example in a positive light. Travis Kalanick, creator of Uber. Not many people know that 10 years ago, he was living in his childhood bedroom because he had failed at two startups. I mean, not just failed a little bit, failed a lot. Um, he had first had a company that was right before Napster, and it got killed like Napster. He tried to turn it into a file-sharing company. He sold it for a de minimis amount of money, didn't make anything, was pretty much washed up, and much older than most entrepreneurs. That rage at his failure fueled Uber. And believe me, there's got a lot of rage there, and that's why it's so successful. <laughs> um, you ha you, one of the things about entrepreneurs is that they really don't, be they believe they can at all times against all disbelief. Even when things go sour, they absolutely believe, I can, I can, I can, I can. And sometimes that works out really well, as in the case of Uber. He, the, the company is completely born, if you had to take a psychological test, from this entrepreneur's belief in himself that the failures that he had were not failures and he was going to go at it again. It's a really, it's an unusual trait among entrepreneurs, and it's almost exactly the same. And you can track that over entrepreneur after entrepreneur. I'm going to give some other um, examples next. I need space. Ah, that's funny. <laughs> um, I think one of the things that entrepreneurs like to say is, if I only had the right people, if I only had the right VCs, if I only had the right market timing, it is never their fault. It is always, they need space, they need time, they need something. In, and in a lot of ways, that sometimes works. In the case, but most of the time it doesn't. Let me name four, four companies who I've heard this kind of argument from. Color. It was an ambient photo sharing company. $41 million gone in investment. Nobody wanted to do ambient photo sharing. And you don't even know what that is, and I'm not going to explain it to you. <laughs> Another one was Juiced. You don't remember Juiced, do you? $45 million later, it was gone. It was a photo, it was a video sharing service that you had to download an independent thing. Uh-oh, YouTube, sorry, Juiced, essentially, what happened to it. Another one was Boo.com. I don't know if anyone bought anything from Boo.com, uh, but that was $135 million. It was a brand fashion. Nobody wanted to buy anything from Boo.com. Again, they thought they could. They thought they could do it against all, all disbelief. The same thing happened with One King's Lane, $125 million, gone. Last one, Friendster. You all remember Friendster? I call it not Facebook. <laughs> it was before Facebook. It had the opportunity to sell to Google right before Google went public, because Google did understand that social networking was important. This was in the nascent days of Facebook, very nascent, when Mark Zuckerberg was 12. Um, <laughs> or he was at Harvard doing naughty things there. Um, they, they did not sell to Google at the time they should have, because the entrepreneur there, and he argues with me about this, but I was actually there, said, I can do it myself. I don't, I can, I can do it, instead of I can't, and sell to Google. I think it was billions and billions of dollars in value gone, because he thought he could do it. Now, in some cases that works, some cases it doesn't, but in more cases than not, the people that say I can, actually can't, and that is one, uh, ask, and they wait for to be the one person who wins the lottery, like a Mark Zuckerberg or an Evan Spiegel at Snapchat. That said, we have the Adele conundrum. Hello, it's me again. One of the things that's really interesting about entrepreneurs is that you have a story the opposite, the absolute opposite way um, to all these failures. Let me recall Amazon.bomb. Do you all remember that? Right in the middle of Amazon's beginnings, he got hit, Jeff Bezos got hit with enormous amounts of Wall Street questioning about the fact that he never made a profit, which he just didn't do until recently, actually. Um, and he persevered through that. He continued, despite enormous pressure on that company, 
almost to the point of it going out of business. Obviously, Steve Jobs is the more, more famous example, but, but Jeff Bezos really pushed through with his vision of a cloud-based uh, system, that, the, the AWS. He pushed through with um, uh, Prime. He pushed through with all kinds of things in a way that, that said, I can, I can, I can, I can. And he said it. He actually just said that. So you do have examples where it actually works. But again, it has to be accompanied by a product people want. Another example is a company called Slack. I don't know if how many people use Slack, but it's the hot enterprise. I know, hot enterprise. It doesn't go together. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it is the hot enterprise thing. It was a game company called, I can't even remember what it was called. Um, I'm sorry, what? Oh, everybody knows. Anyway, it was a game company that Stuart Butterfield, who started Flickr, started in Vancouver. It was a failed, failed, failed game company. Nobody wanted to play his game. And he happened to have a system to that, on that the engineers talked to each other on. It was essentially Facebook for work. He said to, the, to the, the VCs, well, I've spent all your money. I think it was $20 million. So sorry. We still have a few million dollars left, and I've got this kind of cool system. And they're like, ugh, whatever. We lost all their money. Try doing that. Turned out to be slack. It's now worth several billion dollars. So I can't, uh, I can often, often works. Um, so this is a thing that people have. Hello, it's me again. I can do it again. I can, no, against all um, proof otherwise, they think they can do it again. They always fall in love again. This is why I can't leave Silicon Valley after 25 years, and they do drive me nuts. Um, I think one of the things that's great about um, Silicon Valley is that they, they think they will fall in love again. They really believe in love. So do I. I'm going out with someone again. I just got divorced. What? Um, so um, There's a famous quote by Einstein, you can't blame gravity for falling in love. You can't. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs really don't. And I'm struck by a really famous quote by uh, Steve Jobs. He has a lot of great quotes. This is, uh, people don't realize this, but it's actually the fifth anniversary of his death. Um, Steve Jobs was someone who people thought was heartless. I think the problem with Steve Jobs is he was all heart. I, I knew him very well. I interviewed him about 20 times at least and many times on stage at our events. And one of the things he said, and I think it's absolutely true, I'm convinced that half of what separates the successful entrepreneurs from the non-successful is pure perseverance. They do not give up in the face of all that is telling them. Same thing with people who fall in love and have had failures. They keep going, because just around the corner is the one for you, the one that's going to make it, the one that's going to make you finally happy. Um, I'm going to end with a quote from Hamilton. I'm reading that book. It's taken me 16 years to read it, but I'm, <laughs> I swear I'm going to finish it. It's a great book, and I, I recommend it to all of you, because it really is the same problems we have in this country as they did then. The American Revolution, now greatly celebrated, was full of failure, full of moments of real terror, actually, that it all came together. It's astonishing. It should make you all feel better in the current election because they managed to make it through and make all the right decisions, maybe. Maybe at some point we're going to fuck up, I know. Um, but Hamilton said, and I think it's one of the greatest quotes there is, about love, it's about life, it's about entrepreneurship. Perseverance is almost... Perseverance in almost any plan is better than fix, fickleness and fluctuation. So, persevere. Thank you.